briefly introduce uh, uh, Rich. So uh, Richard Sutton is a distinguished research scientist at DeepMind, a professor in the Department of Computing Science at the University of Alberta, and a fellow of the Royal Society, the Royal Society of Canada, the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, and Cypher. Uh, Sutton received a PhD in computer science from the University of Massachusetts in 1984 and a BA in psychology from Stanford University in 1978. Prior to joining the University of Alberta in 2003, he worked in industry at the AT&T Labs and GTE Labs and in academia at the University of Massachusetts. In Alberta, Sutton founded the RLAI, Reinforcement Learning and Artificial Intelligence Lab which now consists of 10 principal investigators and about 100 people altogether. He joined DeepMind in 2017 to co-found their first satellite research lab in Alberta. And he is the co-author of the textbook, Reinforcement Learning and Introduction uh, from MIT Press. I mean, it's a very widely uh, popular uh, book used as a, a textbook in several, several courses across the world. His research interests center on the learning problems facing a decision maker interacting with its environment, which he sees as central to intelligence. And he has additional interests in animal learning psychology in connectionist networks, and generally in systems that continually improve their representations and models of the world. His scientific publications have been cited more than 100,000 times. He's also a libertarian, a chess player, and a cancer survivor. Uh, Rich, uh, it's our honor and pleasure to have you uh, with us. Uh, it's over to you. Over to you, Rich. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Shalab. It's um, well, first, I guess I want to congratulate you and thank you for staying to the end of the workshop. It's the end of your day, the end of your Saturday. I, I appreciate your staying to, to, to hear my, my thoughts. It's just the very, very beginning of the morning here in Alberta. The sun is starting to come up. Uh, I, I've, uh, I'm, I have, I'm still drinking my morning coffee. Yes. Uh, Actually, I'm having sort of Indian milky tea this morning in, in, in your guy's honor. <laughs> okay, um, so my presentation today uh, on the increasing role of experience in artificial intelligence, it's sort of a, um, a more uh, reflective talk. We, we, we reflect on the, the trends that have been occurring in the field. Um, so if we think about all the things that we've heard the last few days, um, a lot of them are about how we solve problems. And whereas this talk is more about uh, which problems we solve, what we do and why. And so we're gonna try to reflect on the field, see the trends and, and try to think about the implications that might ha be have for the, the problems we work on. So the increasing role of experience in AI, well, let's first start with the definition of what we mean by experience. And let's see if I can get the slides to work properly. Oh, good. So by experience, I just mean the ordinary uh, data flowing in and out of an intelligent agent. So we see the picture of the intelligent agent. It receives sensations from the world and it generates actions and sends them to the, sends them to the world. And those two things, the sensations and the actions, are those two time series are what I mean by experience. Now, it's important here that experience is the ordinary interaction. It doesn't mean a special training period like we have in supervised learning. So we would say then that supervised learning does not involve experience in this sense. And uh, while reinforcement learning, we do have experience. We do learn from ordinary interaction. So experience then is the agent's only access to its world. An experience is just bits, it's just data flowing in. It has no meaning, it has no significance only by its relationship to other experience, in particular, 
there's a there's there's one element of experience, the, the reward, which uh, I'll think about as a component of the sensation, a scalar component. And this has a, this is the only one that has meaning, and the meaning is that it's good. We're trying to get the reward. So the question I want you to consider this evening is. Um, will we understand the mind ultimately in terms of experience? Things like sensations and actions and rewards and time steps and all these things that are inside the agent, or will it be understood and explained ultimately in external terms, which I'll call objective terms that are aspects of the external world? Are we gonna talk about external things or are we gonna talk about internal things and, exper and experiential things? External things would be things like objects and places and people and space and motion and distances, all these things that are in the external world, they're not in the agent. So that's really the question that I want you to think about um, because I think it has a very big effect on what we do. So I'm gonna go through uh, four steps in, in the stages or increasing role of experience in AI. And this slide here, you don't need to memorize it. I'm gonna come back to it many times, these four steps over the 70 years of AI's history. So the first step, agenthood, having experience, reward, having goals in terms of experience. Step three, representing the state, or thinking of the state of the agent in terms of experience. And then finally, having knowledge in terms of experience. And what we'll do as we go through each one of these four steps, we'll just sort of recognize, I don't mean this to be a controversial or an argument, just sort of recognize what's happened and recognize that at each one of these four steps, AI has started with a, an external perspective and has sort of slowly, begrudgingly, reluctantly moved towards incorporating experiential points of view. And that we do this in order to be more grounded and more learnable and scalable. Okay, so let's get started. The first step, agenthood, which is really, you know, you need to be an agent in order to have sensations and actions. And let's first just realize that in the early days of AI, the first 30 years, it was rare to have experience. Most AI systems were problem solvers and question answers. They didn't have sensations and actions. Of course, there was always a bit of robotics. That was an exception. Typically though, um, in AI, we would consider problems with the start state and the goal state, operators defined as state transitions, not as actions. And then a solution was a complete sequence of operation, operators that took you from start to goal. And even when you found the solution, you didn't sense or act, you didn't actually execute the solution, the plan. You, because by assumption, all the operators were deterministic and you knew what would happen. You didn't have to confirm your plan that your plan worked because you knew it would work. And so you, it was never, there was never any stage where they executed the, the plan and they would saw whether it worked. There was no sensing. So this is maybe I think quite foreign to us now and it's, it's worth spending a moment realizing how this is, was possible, how we could do AI without experience. Um, so I, I, I uh, I, I dug up this, looked at some old books. This is a, a quote from the preface to um, an early AI textbook by Nils Nilsson, 1980. And at the beginning of the preface, Nils was bragging a little bit about the field as, as the way you do in a textbook to introduce what your, the importance of your topic. So he would say, he said the following, AI systems could da diagnose diseases, plan the synthesis of complex organic compounds, solve differential equations. And notice like all these three, all these things don't involve uh, sensations and actions. They are cognitive tasks. They, they are challenging, but they're not interactive experiential um, problems. Even when you understand limited amounts of, of human speech or natural language text, it was, there was no actions and write small computer programs to meet formal specifications. So those are the kind of things 
that they would talk about in AI at that time. Now, for the last 30 years, it's clear that AI has turned to focus on building agents. And what marks this transition, and the transition was very gradual, um, wasn't, there's was no abrupt form to it, but nevertheless, we can mark it by the first edition of the standard, the now standard AI textbook, uh, Russell and Norvig was in 1995, and they said the following in their preface and introduction. The unif unifying theme of the book is the concept of an intelligent agent. And in this view, the problem of AI is to describe and build agents that receive percepts from the environment and perform actions. So this, at the time, this, this approach to an AI textbook was uh, controversial because it wasn't the, the whole idea of agents wasn't controversial, but the idea of basing the field of AI on this perspective was definitely controversial, uh, but it was foresightful, I think, and, and appropriate. So now, now agents are the standard modern approach. Experience used to be rare in AI, but now it's, it's the standard. Uh, so that's really what I wanted to say about agenthood, the first 30 years and how we've, the field has shifted. Now it's based on, on agents. And it's only when you have agents do you have experience. And notice the pattern. We started by not doing it. And then we sort of reluctantly move towards it and it becomes foundational. Okay, let's go on to step two, reward where we start to have goals in terms of experience. Uh, so let me start here with just reminding you of, with, with a couple of strong statements about how important the reward formulation is of the goal of intelligence. This, these are two quotes. Um, uh, it's now pretty commonplace to um, Think of, think of rewards as, as, as a sufficient way of formulating the goals in AI. The reward hypothesis, this is from the, our reinforcement learning textbook that Andy Barto and I wrote. The reward hypothesis is that all of what we mean by goals and purposes can be well thought of as the maximization of the expected value of the cumulative sum of a received scalar signal called reward. The reward is enough hypothesis just this year by David Silver and others is that intelligence and its associated abilities can be understood as subserving the maximization of reward. So these are a couple of strong statements expressing the idea that uh, this numerical signal that comes from outside the agent, this ex experiential signal is a sufficient way of formulating goals. Um, so, but still, even though we have some strong statements, reward strikes many of us, maybe all of us really, at least initially as insufficient. Reward, you know, maybe it's enough for way animals or for engineering, but it doesn't seem enough for people. It's not enough for intelligence. It, we're talking about a single number that's coming in from outside the mind. It doesn't seem to take into account that people seem to choose their own goals. Reward just seems too small, too limited, too reductive, too demeaning. Surely people's goals are grander, like saving the planet or raising a family, contributing to knowledge, just making the world a better place. Not just to maximize our pleasure and comfort as represented by a scalar number we get from the world. It seems too small. Um, yeah, so we should really uh, recognize this attitude, which is still with us, and many people are definitely uncomfortable still with the idea that a simple number would represent our goals. Um, so now let's take a little bit of the history. In the history, we just, in the early days of AI, when we were doing those problem solving, like with this um, block squirrel example, these early problems, AI formulated the goals as world states to reach it was not experiential. And this is true even in the latest, latest edition of the standard AI textbook of Russell and Norvig. It still defines goals in terms of world states and not experience. 
Although it also has chapters on reinforcement learning and those chapters use reward, of course. Um, and reward is becoming more important. It has become more important over the last few decades. And so it's part of the rise of machine learning. Reward formulation is now becoming almost standard in large parts of the field, it is standard. And certainly in this workshop, it's standard. So we see that in planning, uh, Markov decision processes are now one standard way of formulating planning. And even critics of reinforcement learning, um, I think if Jan LeCun, we would, might, we would say that reward is the cherry on the top of the cake of intelligence. Well, here's another uh, example of where reward has creeped into ways of thinking about AI. This is in the, the SOAR cognitive architecture, which is like a really, really classic, um, good old fashioned symbolic AI system. Good, GoFi is good old fashioned AI, uh, which is no longer uh, an insult, but an embraced term, uh, uh, an old fashioned AI based on symbolic cognitive processing. Um, so SOAR is the classic one started in the 80s. This is sort of a picture of all the components of SOAR, working memory and short-term memory and various buffers, blackboards. Um, and since 2008, uh, this, this SOAR will typically include a component for reinforcement learning and that component will have reward. They accept reward as a way of uh, expressing the goal. That's cool. Um, so that's reward, and we've seen the journey then, how reward has started out as something which is not part of the goal of, it, of our AI, and then it has come to be a major formulation of, of the goal. It's a, it's, it is sort of begrudging or reluctant that we, uh, that we accept, and or at least partially accept, uh, the reward formulation of, of goals, an experiential formulation. So before we go on to the next two steps, which are a little bit more uh, in progress, whereas the first two, agenthood and reward are things which sort of have happened, largely happened already. But before we go into the next two, I wanna take a little interlude and give you a more uh, explicit sense of what I'm talking about when, when, I'm with ex when I talk about experience. So uh, this is, I'm gonna be presenting a concrete example of experience. It's, it's imaginary. It means this, the data I'm gonna show you are made up, but they will help us think about it. So the data will consist of sensory signals. So here we have a bunch of sensory signals, nominal values and, and a reward number. And these are arriving at time zero. And we're taking an action, which is a, a binary vector or three components. And then this happens at each moment in time. So if we play it into the future, uh, we will see all time series for each sensory signal until we get finally to the most recent sensory signal and the uh, most recent action or the time step seven, we would be like here. You think of a time step as some small interval, like a 10th of a second or, or, or faster. And this is what, uh, really, life is like we have this, this these uh, signals coming at us. Um, but you know, all these numbers, it's kind of hard to get intuition about. So I'm going to color them. I'm going to color them, in, uh, and simplify them. I thought I was. Here, here we've changed them to colors uh, and I haven't done anything special. I've just taken the, the zeros and ones and colored them white and gray. And these uh, other signals, which I take one of four values, I've given them four colors. And so all the threes are changed to yellow and all the twos are changed to blue and so on. Um, the actions are also binary, but they're a different kind of thing. So I'm going to just show them as circles, but also grays and whites for the zeros and ones. And 
the reward, the reward is a scalar signal. It's, it, it can be positive or negative. And so I'll use green for positive and pink for negative. And then on the, the length of this bar is gonna indicate how, how big the magnitude of the quantity. Okay, so that's the, that's the coloring convention. I think we all understand that. Now that you understand that I can remove the, the numbers. Uh, so just to make it visually simpler and we can intuitively see what's going on, we can look for patterns because that sort of is the bottom line. That's what intelligence is about. It's uh, finding patterns in our data and then learning to predict and control the data. So if you stare at this data for a while, you might see some patterns, some interrelationships between the actions and the sensations are, are within the sensations themselves. Um, so let me just show you one. You, you'd find it if you took a while, but if you, if you do look, you'll find that there's a relationship between the last action and the next sensation, the next, the, the first bit of the next sensation. So this carries on and then it's true throughout the uh, throughout the sequence that the last bit of action influences or seems to influence the next the, the next first bit of sensation. Okay, um, what else can we see here? Well, there is there are other patterns. So here we see the um, a thing where if on one time step we have a, a red pixel in the fifth column, uh, then we have the sixth pixel and the next time step is green. We see that on, this, on these time steps and on these time steps. We don't know, it could just be by chance. Um, and so we need more data. So let's, make, let's extend this time series and a little bit further and see what happens. So here we extend farther down and let's make a couple of columns worth. Um, and then we can see, um, that pattern we talked about before. And if you look further into the future, this does recur many, many, many times. So many, many times you can see that the, the red and green pixels follow each other in successive uh, sensory signals here. Um, and let me give you one more example. After each one of, after this pattern of the, the red followed by the green, and then two steps later, uh, there's actually a blue pixel. Let me call them pixels. And that's held up in these two cases. And it actually it's held up throughout the data stream. So that's an example where we are able to predict what's going to happen um, by remembering where we've come from. And uh, it's a pattern in the data. Okay, so let me let me go on and make some even more general remarks. Um, first of all, you know, we in some sense we just have these arbitrary bits or arbitrary signals coming in the sensations, and yet they can be qualitatively different. The first four, are, for example, are are binary, whereas the next seven are have four values. The last one is a uh, as a scalar value it can be positive and negative and varying its size. These are qualitative differences. But there are other qualitative differences that have to do with the predictive relationships. So we saw that some of the signals we are able to predict from others, and that tells you that makes them qualitatively different. Um, and there are many, many things to predict. I, I've just shown you some really simple ones, um, uh, but there is a, a wide, a wide, not just wide range, but a deep range. There's great depth in terms of what kind of predictive relationships there are, what kind of patterns there can be in the data. Um, let me show, uh, well, the ones that I've shown you where we are, we're just trying to predict signals and where the predictions are predictions of specific values of specific signals at specific times. Well, that's, that's what I've shown you so far, but the notion of prediction is much more subtle and complex than that. Um, and um, I just have to, I have to, invoke your imagination to, uh, to think about all the possible complexities. But there's one complexity that you are already familiar with. 
and that is um, the value function. Uh, so in the value function, we are trying to predict the reward. We're trying to predict the sum of the future reward. We're trying to predict the sum of future reward. We're not trying to predict any particular reward. We're not trying to predict any signal that will later occur. We're trying to predict the discount sum of the future. Um, so we'll remind, let me remind you what that is. I'm gonna draw that as a, the additional column to the data. And that's what you see here. These, these are not part of the data. They're, they are, and in fact, the, what, they are the returns. So they are the, this uh, quantity here, this large green bar is the sum of the rewards weighted by this exponential uh, factor. Uh, which gives the greatest weight to the most recent reward and less weight to the, far, the subsequent ones. And this it's generally a green region following this time step. And so that's why it's such a large green bar. Um, now remember, these are just the ideal predictions. This is something that the agent might estimate, might produce, might approximate at these times. It's not in the data. The, the, the return is never in the data. And yet we can learn it, and you know how we can learn it using uh, using TD methods if we want to do it with uh, low computation or even other methods. Now when we this this we do this applies at every moment in time. So here we're shifting along and looking at so here, for example, the the sum of future rewards is largely negative. We get a uh, a pink return, a negative return, and it continues to slide along when we try to predict these uh, properties of the future rewards. Uh, here we have an unusually large negative rewards sequence coming up. Um, so I bring up the value functions. We are gonna, these are our, our major technology for making predictions. The notion of value function has been generalized though, what we call general value functions, GVFs, and these can predict any signal, I guess that's kind of trivial. There's nothing special about the reward. It, it's numerical, but even once you're predicting sums, you could want to, might want to predict the discounted sum of a binary reward. And you might want to weight it exponentially, or you might want to weight it with a, by a different temporal envelope. And we can do that nowadays with general value functions. We can get our arbitrarily, uh, arbitrary envelopes, and the envelopes can depend upon what happens. And what I one thing I want you to note is that um, Although we have this great flexibility, there's many, many things to predict. Not, not all the things you can predict can be done in a computationally, con computational congenial fashion, in an efficient fashion, with low memory, low, low computation, low, low communication and low memory. And so we are, uh, and we wanna do everything in a scalable way. So we're gonna be very sensitive to the computational complexity. It's a real subject of research. Okay, so that's a little introduction to um, experience and how the major role of intelligence is finding out how to think about experience, how to predict it, how to form concepts that will enable you to predict it, and, and how to control it. Controlling it is the ultimate measure of intelligence. Can we control the reward? Can we get lots of reward? Okay. So with that interlude, let's resume our progression. Let's go on to, to state, experiential state. Can we think of state in terms of experience? So as usual, I'm gonna start by recognizing that we, it's not our natural, natural tendency to think of state in terms of experience. It's our natural tendency to think of state in terms of the external world. So classic AI, we characterize state as the objectively, so classically, um, going back to Bloch's world again, we'd say things like, oh, Block C is on Block A, or uh, John loves marriage. This is just facts about the world. It's not facts about our experience. More modern times, we do probabilistic graphical models, but still there, the state is a probability distribution over the world state variables. So this little diagram is a, as a, educational example where we talk about the states of the world. Is it cloudy outside? Is it raining? Is the grass wet? These are obviously external 
events, and that's how we characterize the state. In POMDPs, um, we will we'll have the concept of latent states, external state variables, world states, and then the, um, the belief state will be a probability distribution over those possible latent world states. So all these are what I call objective state representations, external state representations. They're far from experience. Um, and you know, what's one of our ontologies, the classic ontologies in AI, we talk about places and physical objects and abstract objects like numbers and sequences. And uh, back on the physical side, we have you know, solids and, and animals and all kinds of external things. These are the basic ontology of objects and things, the things that make up the world of uh, much of AI. So let's now talk about what's the alternative, because that seems very natural world. Uh, but the alternative to, to this objective state is experiential state, in which the state of the world is defined entirely in terms of experience. So in this box, we really have the statement. Experiential state is a summary of past experience that's useful for predicting and, and controlling future experience. Use experience to predict experience. A summary of the past that's good for predicting the future. There's no mention of the external world, no mention of external entities out there in the world. There's just things that you can see and then more things that you can see, and maybe can try to influence. So this just notice how different the worldview is in these two cases. One is you're talking about the external world and where is it in this state or in that state? In the other case, you're saying, well, I've seen this, and so I expect this. So I think you're thinking now of modern AI, many parts of it embrace experiential state, almost superficially, if you think about how DQN, deep Q network works, where they just, their state is like the last four video frames. It's even more common, I guess, to, to take the last observation as, as the state. Um, but when you, if, you do, if you do have the last uh, few uh, observations as or sensations as your state, then you can also include some of your recent actions. Going on to the compression approaches to AI, that's where you uh, just try to compress your past experience in order and, and use use it, um, well, it's implicitly predicting as, as you try to compress, but they're clearly not trying to talk about the external world, they're just talking about bits. You look at some bits and try to predict the other bits. Predictive state representations are of this form uh, as our observer, observation operator model, models and LSTMs, long short-term memories and deep learning, these are all all about the data, they're not about external objects. Generate and test approach to feature discovery are also like that. All these approaches learn or discover their experiential state. It's not given to them, and it is just um, a summary of the, of the past experience. So this, this direction is viable and it's one of the active research frontiers. Um, let's talk a little bit more about experiential state. This, this sequence here is meant to remind you of the colored blocks where you have you know, colored pixels of sensation and then, and then action and it progresses over time. And the role of state in that picture is that it sort of lies between the sensation and the action. There's the state, right? Using, this state is meant to summarize everything, everything in how you got here. And so that summarizes your past and then you use that summary to predict the future and, and to control the future to, to, to select your next action. But this is kind of awkward. If you look at this, it's awkward because the state here has got to depend on all the earlier things in principle infinitely far back into the past. It's a lot of, of, uh, of connections, a lot of wires, a lot of computation. What you'd really want to do it uh, recursively, so it would look more like this. Um, the, the state would be constructed from the most recent action and sensation, 
And in place of all the stuff that came before would be the last, the previous state, because that each state is supposed to summarize what all that came before. And so you can, should be able to construct this state out of just these three uh, items, as this is a summary of all that came before. So then it, it turns into a, like a lattice structure as you're constructing the state at each moment in time. And uh, that's the natural way to maintain your experiential state. So if we look, want to think about this as a picture, it would be something like this. We have our agent. Our agent receives sensations and it's going to produce some experiential state. Remember the experiential state will be used for prediction and control. So it'll be used for control. It'll, it will be sent to the policy, the policy will select the actions, and that experiential state will also be used to generate various predictions. The experiential state also used to update itself using the last sensation, the last action, the last the old state comes back. And this box, this state generating box, it's naturally called perception because perception is precisely how we integrate all that we observe and have done into a sense of where we are. It's really appropriate to call this perception, the generation of state. Okay. So that's the end of experiential state. Um, we've seen the steps. We, AI started thinking in objective terms, external terms, so reluctantly, gradually is moving perhaps towards uh, something experiential methods in order to be scalable and grounded and learnable. Now let's go on to the last, perhaps the biggest step, the most cutting edge step, which is knowledge. How can we think, can we think of knowledge in predictive terms? Um, can we move in this direction? Have we moved in this direction? So if we look, uh, let's just start with common sense. Well, these are common sense statements that we normally think as what knowledge means. Knowledge, who's the president of the US? Uh, where is the, the Eiffel Towers in Paris? Most birds have wings. These are bits of knowledge, common sense knowledge that we think of most clearly as knowledge. We know that Oregon is north of California. And perhaps at any moment in time, we might know the car, the car is 10 meters ahead or fire engines are red. These are all, don't seem to be about experience at all. This is where AI has started thinking about knowledge. But other things do seem to be more like ex experience, predictions of experience. It's a long walk to the city center. I can lift 200 pounds. It's cold outside today. My spouse is blonde. My foot is sore. The seventh pixel will be blue in three steps. Obviously that one uh, came from our example. And so this is very much experiential. We know how that could be done. We know how the prediction could be, could be made based on finding a pattern in the data. But it seems very, very far from like Joe Biden as president of the US. There's a huge gap between these two. Um, and yet we might hope to cross them, you know, because these things are more experiential and maybe, maybe fire engines are red. It's got an experiential element to it. Can we, there, I mean, the, the, the main observation is that there's a huge gap. And then the question is, is it crossable? <clears throat> we see why they're advantageous to expressing knowledge experientially because then it could be learned um, and verified. And it's got a clear semantics. I know, we know what it means. We know what it means uh, when we say a pixel will be blue in three steps in a much clearer way than we do and we know what it means when we say the Eiffel Tower is in Paris. Um, of course, we, you know, yeah, one is more natural for us talking to each other, and one is maybe more explicit for a machine to implement. But that I think is the essential challenge. Um, okay, now consider, go back to a historical perspective. Uh, classical, good old fashioned AI systems, they didn't have experience, so they, they couldn't predict. They couldn't have knowledge be about experience because they had no experience. And it's true that much modern AI still treats knowledge as database entries. It would look like here, the president of the US is Joe Biden, the capital of 
France, is Paris, database entries. And um, uh, this is, a, if we go back to um, probabilistic graphical models, where we have, uh, you know, we want to talk about the knowledge about the relationship between it being cloudy and, and, the prob and, and it possibly raining or the grass being wet. Um, still, uh, these systems, these probabilistic graphical models, uh, deals with simultaneous events. It doesn't deal with, with a, a genuine prediction. I predict, put predicts in quotes because it's really simultaneous events. The, the, the meaning of the knowledge here is that if it's cloudy, um, it's likely to, to be raining. There's a good chance that it's raining. It's, it's not temporal. It's not that the, the, it being cloudy is not a prediction of rain. Rain is not a prediction of, of grass. It's not a prediction in the sense that, that uh, it, it might happen prior to. It is, they, they often call it prediction, but it's all the events are really simultaneous. There's a joint probability distribution over these uh, external world variables. And um, it's, not, it's not genuine prediction. Um, but a genuine prediction, like in a, if you have a Markov decision process and you have transition probabilities, they are genuine predictions that if you're in one state at one time, then at the next state, you'll be in a, at the next time step, you'll be in a different state. So, so the appeal of prediction is it does give you a clear kind, genuine prediction. So it gives you a clear kind of knowledge and which has a clear semantics it is statements about the world. And so this predictive model of the world is becoming AI's uh, new view of knowledge. This is common, particularly for in this workshop where we're talking about deep reinforcement learning. It's, it's, um, it's the standard way of thinking about knowledge. It's a, it's, a, it's a model of the world, allows you to predict the world, allows you to predict what will happen to the world. And maybe the cutting edge of this predictive knowledge is general value functions and option models, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but let's, let's approach gradually, because I'm trying to say something about world knowledge, which is a very broad uh, notion. And so let's break it down into its different kinds and, and be more clear. Uh, so when I talk about world knowledge, I'm not including mathematical knowledge. And that's because in an important sense, mathematical knowledge, as important as it is, it's absolutely important uh, and it's, it's, it's truer in a more fundamental sense, in a very fundamental sense. It's perhaps the only thing we can know with certainty uh, because math, math, is, math is true in any world um, and thus it's not true. It's not, it's not a fact about the world. It's, it's just independent of the world. And so I'm not counting it as world knowledge. It's just true in any world it's really not about the world. Okay, so we're really talking about more empirical knowledge. Um, and we can divide that into two types. One is knowledge about the state. And that's what we already have talked about in step three. And the other is knowledge about the dynamics, which we're dealing with now. How does the world change? How does the experience change? So, uh, and then finally, these last two bullets are about really the topic that I'm talking about when I mean I need to refer to when I say world knowledge, I'm talking about dynamics knowledge. And, and that could be divided up really into four ways, two binary distinctions. Uh, first distinction is it can be state to state as this state I predict will be followed by that state or state to experience as in this state will be followed by a return of seven. Okay, the, the value function is state to experience knowledge. And then those states can be either objective states or they can be experiential states. So just to fix that notion in your mind that this, this partition of the kinds of dynamics knowledge, I, I'll make a four by a two by two table. I'm not super interested in the contents of the table. Let's look at the divisions, these are the two divisions that I've talked about. The state can be objective or it can be experiential. And then the knowledge can be either about state transitions or it can be uh, from states to experience. 
and then we get at least four primary kinds of predictive world dynamics knowledge. And finally, this state-to-state -state predictive models, they don't have to be low level. I mean, I've used the example of transition probabilities. That's pretty low level. You might also be thinking as we often do in reinforcement learning about the differential equations or the equations that specify the, the low level dynamics of the world, sort of the physics model. And that doesn't have, that, that's, so those are important cases, but they don't have to be the, the primary cases. We can be more abstract than that. Like the state can be abstracted when you have experiential state like this. And um, the models can also be abstracted time. And that's where we're gonna bring in the notion of options, which are entire ways of behaving. An option is a policy plus a termination condition. And you can have uh, the transition model for an option. Like if I was to start walking to the city center, that would not terminate for several minutes but I would have knowledge like if I walk to the city center, then what time will it be when I get there? Or what will I see when I get there? What state will I be in when I get there? Uh, and the transition models can be learned and we have algorithms, known algorithms for learning them, even the off policy case. So we have this technology for abstraction and the question is what, is there, what are its limits? It's not clear what the limits are. Um, we want to cross the abstraction gap. We want to be able to say more and more abstract things, more and more things that sound closer to common sense knowledge, um, and thus close the abstraction gap between experience and common sense knowledge. And it's a general question of how far this can go. Um, the gap is great, but remember just the ways in which experience is fundamental to our knowledge. You know, by definition, we, our agents, we can gain information about the world only through our sensors, and we affect the world only through our actions. And so really we know the world only through our experience. And it really follows then that everything we know is a fact about our experience. It's a fact about the data sequence, the pattern in the data. Uh, remember the colored pixels and how we, can, we learn facts about them by looking at them. And everything we know is such, such a fact about the data stream and its relationship to our, to our actions, or the parts of it relationship to, to each other. So this perspective seems pretty much inescapable to me. And it's really good in the long run because if the knowledge is a fact about experience, then we can learn it from experience. It's a good, it would be a good thing. And so this is what draws us to experience, even though we don't normally start by thinking of knowledge in experiential terms. We are drawn to it just as we're drawn to experience in the other three steps. Okay, so that's predictive knowledge. We're drawn to think of it because, because it enables us to be grounded and learnable and scalable. Scalable means uh, as we get more computation, we can use it to to uh, effectively to become or agents get better and better as we get more um, computation with Moore's law and so forth. So let me try to, uh, as I finish up now, let me try to look at uh, how you could bring all the four steps together. What would the agent look like if you did that? It would look uh, like this diagram. Combining the steps, we get, I call this the standard model of the experiential agent. It includes the perception box, as we talked about before, whose primary task is to become available, make the state, the state is available to the policies, because uh, you could have several policies, and in particular when you're learning options. And these things generate action. Um, the primary predictions are the value functions, the, the main value function, which through learning is adjusting the main policy. And if you have, um, uh, other value functions for the other options, they would also adjust those policies. And there are other predictions is that we make a transition model of the world um, and that is used by planning processes to adjust the policies. So we end up with a picture of the agent that they have these four primary components. And uh, 
we're and state is at the center of it. Not all the arrows are are are, are sh all the int in interactions are shown in this diagram, of course, to keep it simple. But those are the four basic things and the four major interactions. Okay, so let's to wrap it up. Let's remind ourselves why it is that we don't like experience. <laughs> why it is we avoid it? We approach it only reluctantly as we have in the history of AI, always started with something else. And I, I do wanna have sympathy for that and understand why we don't like experience. The reason we don't like experience is because it's, it's, it's unfamiliar, it's, it's uh, unintuitive, it's, it's constantly changing and, and ephemeral, it's complicated. And I think most of all, just because it's super low level, like you can't talk about it. Um, it's even if, even if it's, even if you could talk at such a detailed level about what's happening to you, it's, it's private, it's subjective. Um, you can't talk to other people like, I saw this pixel and then I twitched this signal. No, no, you, ha you have to talk to each other. You have to talk to each other to verify your knowledge. You, you've got to use experiential terms. And so the strong statement is that um, public external terms are clearly superior to experiential terms for everything that humans do, except there may be an exception. And that is that for creating AI, maybe we have to, to, have to break it down to experiential terms because we're our AIs have to actually deal with that, that experience. But it's just for talking to each other. We, we, that's why we have these um, external terms for talking to each other. Um, so you can't talk to your program in experiential in, in external terms. You have to talk to it in terms that has meaning to it, terms, terms that it can sense and, and, and measure and, and see, and that's exp experience. Okay, so then why why do we like or should like experience? You know, first of all, because it comes from the normal operation of our AI. It's free data, and that, it's that freeness or the plentifulness of ordinary experience, which makes it so important for learning and verifying uh, and for scaling our, 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 our understanding of the world as we get more computation. It's free data and it grounds everything. It grounds the notion of intelligence, um, provides something for intelligence to be about. It means it's just about finding patterns in and understanding this data. Uh, it grounds knowledge. Knowledge is predicting uh, about the data so it provides something for knowledge to be about rather than just to be true. Um, and it, that ultimately comes from, from the idea that any fact about the world is a fact about experience and thus can be verified or learned from experience. Okay, so in summary, I've discussed all these, these four major steps in the increasing role of sensory motor experience in AI, agenthood, reward, state and knowledge, having experience goals in terms of experience state, in terms of experience and knowledge in terms of experience. And for each step I've shown that AI has chosen first to work in non-experiential external terms, but there is a less familiar approach that's based on experience and that has important, that has important advantages in grounding learnability and scaling. Now, the first two steps are largely past. Uh, the, the second two steps are sort of ongoing and we don't really know uh, that they, I mean, even if we see trends, it doesn't mean that the trends will continue, uh, but it does suggest that maybe they will and that we, they can involve substantial changes. We might wanna get ahead of them. So the trend has farther to go if it's gonna go farther. In particular, steps three and four are, are not complete. There are research opportunities we can get on this, these trends and contribute to them. And I think they're gonna also, they're gonna continue to be important. And that ultimately the story of intelligence may well be told in terms of these internal sensory motor experience terms. Um, now I, I, I've said lots of things and I wanna reduce it to some simple thing, almost a slogan level. And if I was to do that, the slogan would be something like this. Data drives AI and experience is the ultimate data. Okay, thank you for your attention.
I'm going to take questions now. I, I just at least a little bit of time, and mm -hmm. but I'll, let me start by prompting just a little bit uh, questions you might have right at the beginning. Um, you may be sitting thinking that not everything is learned from experience. Some things are built in, which is absolutely true. But my point is not that everything is learned from experience, but that everything is about experience. Even if it's built it in, you'd, you'd want to build it in as a fact about experience rather than just a, a global float in the air fact about the external world. Another question that you undoubtedly are thinking is that um, surely people can build in important abstractions, which can save the age and a lot of time. And why not, why not do focus on that and add the links to experience later? Well, the problem is that this, this is what we've tried in the past and it's never worked. And this is sort of the bitter lesson if you've read that. Um, on the other hand, people could build in knowledge after they build in the, ex, the experiential abstractions. Um, and maybe this is what happens with people. We all learn how the world works when we are playing in sandboxes. And then after that, we can talk to each other and share a lot of knowledge very efficiently. And of course, another knowledge, another perspective that I have a lot of sympathy for is that the abstraction gap between experience and knowledge is so big, um, so big, yes, uh, but so is our computers, so our computer power and our human ingenuity, and we should be ambitious and try to cross this gap. Okay, now I welcome your questions. Thanks a lot, Rich, for that. Thank you very much. Talk. I mean, I have, we have some questions. So uh, Ramod wants to know if, uh, he wants to ask regarding unconscious and conscious actions, why are some experiences attached to conscious states? Uh, is there some sense of, uh, actions in that uh, sort of thing, conscious versus unconscious actions? Well, of course, uh, consciousness is still uh, controversial as a, as a scientific topic, but, but I will totally agree that, that uh, there are internal processes going on inside the mind, and those are, uh, um, we have cognitive actions, uh, and those, um, uh, so I, I, the, the, the message that experience is so important, um, I don't mean it in the sense that, that the things going on inside the agent are unimportant. Um, the, we, we want to, we, I, I mean it more like things going on outside the agent are, are, are less important and can't be the basis. So anything that's going on inside, uh, then, then it can become like data. It can become uh, things that you would predict and control, in which case the, uh, all the internal actions like choosing to think about this, this uh, subject rather than, than that subject, those would be uh, thought of as actions. I, I certainly would want to include those. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Uh, there's another question. So essentially, so, so I guess uh, what, uh, what is, uh, Trying to ask is that if uh, yeah, give me a second. So what he is trying to ask is that if uh, uh, you are trying to model, let's say, a robotic agent, uh, so you would use need a large number of sensors uh, essentially. So the more the sensors you have, the better would be your model, I believe. Yeah, more sensors are good. Okay, so uh, can you can you go back to the slide where uh, Rich you had uh, described the summary of the states and experience and uh, the way the evolution happens? Uh, where the way it evolves, like this thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the one prior to the, yeah, yeah, yeah. This one. So here you have state, then you have action, then sensation. So. In a classic uh, MDP model, you would sort of think of sensation as noise that depends on the state and action, the prior state and action, and that leads to the, mm -hmm. is that a good way of thinking about it? 
so there's a little bit, uh, uh, the word state has many meanings and we, we use it uh, both, you know, as a, as a, the thinking about the external world, the external world has some state and it uses it. It is used to generate our sensations. Um, uh, but the, 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 the most important notion of state is that, uh, that the agent uses within itself to, to make its choices and to make its predictions. So you could think that there's an agent state and which that that's would be the one I'm talking about here. And then there's the external state of like a palm DP. And so in that case, let's go to the palm DP case. It's a kind of a good case to think about clearly. The external state uh, and then the internal state would be more like the belief state, which is the probability distribution over the external states. Um, so I'm really definitely talking about the internal state, the state that's inside the agent. So it'd be analogous to the belief state, but I'm opposed to the idea that we should think of our internal thing as a probability distribution over external things. Sure, sure. Yeah, Arun would like to know whether the summary of experience that seems to be related to the concept of latent features and where do you imagine we could, uh, we go, uh, we could go from here? Yes, the, the, the notion of a latent uh, feature or latent state is, is exactly um, exactly what I, uh, I want to, well, I was gonna say that I'm opposed to, but it, it's really, it's a non-experiential point of view. The idea is that there's something that's not uh, clearly visible in the, in the, um, in the data, but still it's, it, it's, you're gonna orient your state representation around these things that are, that are hidden or entangled in the data. Uh, so just all that language, all that way of thinking is, is saying, oh, there is some real external thing that's simple and latent and unobserved. And I wanna recover that external thing. That's all uh, a point of view that's taking the external thing as primary rather than taking the data as primary, the experiential data as primary. I think the world is actually just really, really complex. And, and the most important things for me, for me to represent about it are probably not in the world itself. Like if you have an uncertainty about something, that uncertainty is not in the world. The world knows what it's doing, <laughs> but, but you have to represent that you're unsure um, what's gonna happen next. And uh, yeah, the whole notion of latent variables is, is, is exactly the external objective point of view rather than an experiential point of view. Sure, thanks. So there's a large question by Kartikeyan. Kartikeyan, would you like to uh, ask that question? Unmute yourself. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, I wanted to take uh, one example from your slides where you said, uh, would I be able to lift uh, 100 pounds or 200 pounds, right? So let me just qualify the example a little bit more. Suppose, suppose I want to know, given that I used to be able to lift 100 pounds four months ago, and given that I had a surgery in the last few months, would I be able to lift at least 80 pounds tomorrow, right? Suppose I ask a question like that. Now, it definitely seems to fit roughly your notion of predicting experience. But uh, I mean, being familiar with causal theories, this also has a counterfactual flavor. So preemptively, I want to ask you this question. If you were to agree that this requires some notion of counterfactuals as causal people understand it, all theories of causality we know embrace realism in a philosophical sense, at least as far as I know. But the view advocated in your talk is more, I would say, idealism, right? So my question to you is, in your fourth step of predicting future experience, what role does causality, counterfactual thinking, or even any realistic model of the world play a part or not? Or do you think it's probably not relevant and it could be done away with in some indirect way? So that's my question. Well, I think you've done a very good job in sort of uh, pointing out that the normal, uh, the work that's done under the title of causal reasoning is, is realist, realistic or, or external, it, it, external oriented. It's oriented towards the external world rather than the internal 
uh, life of the agent and the sensations of the agent. Um, uh, yeah, so that would include that work as among that which is uh, very externally oriented. Um, so, so that's good. I mean, in the talk, I'm trying to be objective. I'm trying to, no, I'm not, not, I don't like to be objective. I'm trying to be uh, um, descriptive and talk about what's happened in the field and what, what is happening. And there, there are trends and counter trends. The recent interest in causal models is a counter trend where um, they are reinvigorating the view that uh, the external view of the world is important and that, that our, our computations should be about reconstructing what's going on externally. Um, that's, a, that's a counter trend. And, and so I want you to see these trends for what they are. Uh, they're taking us away from experience um, and they'll have, they'll have strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, The causality, the, the whole notion of counterfactual is, uh, is all about uh, the external world. And it's, 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 it's not talking about experience. You have to decide for yourself what you think about that, but I hope you'll agree and see with me uh, these trends and these two points of view. That, that, that compete with each other over time and, and, and try to assess whether, whether there has been movement in one direction or the other, and whether, whether the movement is good or whether it's bad. Uh, the whole point is to, is to see that, see what's happening. It's more important to see what's happening. And then we will gradually develop our opinions about, about which way it will move in the future. And, and I very much, the reason I give the talk in this sort of I'm gonna say gentle way, is that I know that people have very different points of view and they have held them for long periods of time. And so I can't, we can't totally change people's minds. We have to sort of um, expose them to, to historical observations and, and leave, it, uh, leave it up to, maybe each person can move in a direction, but we can't absolutely move towards one side. So one way of saying is many of you out there, many of you may say, well, of course it's experiential. Of course, knowledge is like a, a transition probability. Of course, why are you spending all this time on it? Well, uh, but then there are others of you that say, no, knowledge about the world is about the world and it's external. And, and so there's all these different points of view and, um, we have to try to see what's happened to get some uh, perspective on it. Causality is a counter trend in I think the broader trend. Thanks a lot, Rich. Uh, let's on behalf of everyone, let me clap for the wonderful talk that Rich has given. And this actually closes- Thank you. Uh, yeah.